We're really excited about that, right? We really like talking about perineal fistulas, and so, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll probably won't last the hour, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about it. And for the applicants, just so you know, uh, the way we kind of do at least a lot of my talks and the way we're kind of moving in how we, uh, we give these talks is that beforehand I, I make a little video for the uh, residents. Uh, this is just a, uh, a screenshot from the video. And it's kind of a, if you watch Khan Academy at all, it's kind of Khan Academy style chalkboard talk that kind of goes through uh, the big picture of what I'd like the residents to know. And we don't have these videos last. I don't have them last any more longer than about 12 or 13 minutes. So you can watch it when you're having dinner, just a quick video. Um, and then so when they come to the lecture, they're kind of primed with the information they need to know. And the idea um, is that they would get more out of it in that context. So hopefully they've had a chance to look at it. And we'll go through the content uh, in the next few minutes. So we got some objectives, right? By the end of this hour, I want you guys to know a few things. On a bigger picture, I mean, even this is even for the applicants. If I'm kind of successful with what I'm attempting to do today, all of you are going to, are going to go to the reading room after this and have an approach to uh, interpreting MRIs for perianal fistulas. Um, more specifically, I'd like you to focus on the anatomy. If you understand the anatomy of this region, that's half the battle. Right? They don't teach that stuff really well in med school. And uh, uh, a lot of the times, you learn it while you're in the reading room itself. So, in terms of anatomy, if you're able to identify the internal and external sphincters, that would be one success. There's a whole bunch of different types of perianal fistulas that we're going to go through. If you're able to identify perhaps the two most common, you can recite that at the end of this talk. I think that would be a good thing to achieve. And finally, we're going to go through a systematic approach to how to interpret these studies. And by that, I mean we're going to have a reporting checklist. So if you have an idea of, of how to kind of go through these cases with that reporting checklist, uh, that would be amazing as well. So we'll start off with anatomy. This is a coronal uh, schematic uh, of our picture of the uh, lower gastrointestinal tract or at the level of the anus here. This is the sagittal image just to orient everybody here. Uh, this is the bladder, that's the uterus, and that's uh, the large bowel. That's the pubic symphysis, one of our bones, and the uh, coccyx as it comes around over here. As it turns out, anatomically speaking, the anal canal really is at the, uh, if you come work backwards, at the level, it reaches upwards to the level of the dentate line. So what's the dentate line? You've kind of probably come across that at some point. Um, the dentate line is that area where kind of the squamous epithelium that is contiguous with the skin goes upwards and transitions to the columnar epithelium that is more often seen uh, throughout the rest of the GI tract. And, there's no line per se, and it's certainly not colored in blue, but there's going to be a, an area where this transition takes place. And there's a whole bunch of glands in that location. That becomes important when we talk about perianal fistulas. Now, that's from an anatomic perspective. From a surgical perspective, from an imaging perspective, we define it a little bit differently. So there's this nice muscle called the puborectalis, and uh, you know, it goes from the pubic symphysis, goes all the way back, and wraps around a portion of the bowel, and then actually slings back up again. And it's at this posterior impression of the puborectalis that I want you to pay attention. Everything above it will be you know, rectum and the remainder of the large bowel. And everything below it will be the anus. And the anus ranges in size anywhere from 3.5 to 5 centimeters based on the surgical and imaging anal canal. So that's kind of the definition we're going to be using for this talk. This is what it looks like on imaging. I'm sure all of you have seen MRs. And if you haven't, we'll orient you again. This is what we call a T2-weighted image. And very simply put, in T2-weighted imaging, anything that contains fluid is bright. So our bladder contains fluid, so this is our bladder. It's going to be bright. This is the pubic symphysis. That's the large bowel. That's a really big uterus with lots of fibroids, and that's the coccyx. And you're not going to see the puborectalis in this plane because it's going to go like this, but you're going to see its posterior impressions. It's going to be this area over here, just like that, that red portion. And so everything above this kind of hypothetical line we can draw the puborectalis over here. It's going to be large bowel and everything below it is going to be the anus. So we look at our sagittal images to help us with that. So I'm sure you guys have thought about this at some point in your careers. You know, what is the function of the anus? I never really thought about this. Um, but I think it's important to, to think about it because uh, it makes things a little bit easier. And the way I look at it, it's nothing but a big sphincter. 
right? It's what allows us to decide we want to go to the bathroom or we want to keep it in for a little bit longer until the lecture's over, right? So uh, it essentially acts as a sphincter. And uh, this is an axial image here. That's going to be a portion of the anus. That's uh, the vagina. That's the urethra in this particular patient. And it's made up as a sphincter of two different muscles. All right? So these are the things that I want you to know, these muscles. The first one is the internal sphincter. Now, the internal sphincter is easy in the sense that it's just a continuation of the circular muscle of the rectal wall. So when I'm going to show you images, when you see the rectum, or when you see the anus, essentially, whatever you see there is going to be composed in, for practical purposes of the internal sphincter. On MRI, it's going to be very difficult to differentiate you know, the anus itself from the internal sphincter. So we'll consider that all the internal sphincter. So that's an axial image. Let's see what it looks like on uh, coronal imaging. So this is kind of mirrors this a little bit, but uh, this is other T2 weighted images. And your anus is going to go all the way from about here to here. Okay. And this is this kind of grayish looking structure here is going to be your anus. And for our practical purposes, the entire breadth from here to here, we can consider that the internal sphincter. Not all of it in reality is the internal sphincter, but you cannot differentiate it from the other different layers of the anus. On axial imaging, so kind of uh, reflecting this uh, diagram over here, this is going to be your anus. And again, for practical purposes, we're going to consider this whole thing as our internal sphincter. Okay. Well, that's not good enough. We need two sphincters to help us. And so that's the internal sphincter. And then you have an external sphincter. That its name implies is external to the anus, right? So this is the external sphincter over here. It's a voluntary muscle. And as you go upwards, its superior aspect of it is contiguous with other muscles in the pelvic floor, namely the puborectalis muscle. And I say that because it can sometimes be very difficult to differentiate those muscles on imaging. But for your purposes, when you have a muscle that's kind of paralleling the wall of the anus on the coronal uh, plane like this, all that's going to be your external sphincter. And it comes around, it's the uh, right over here, and kind of does a, a boomerang and, and wraps around the anus over here. So what does that look like on imaging? So again, our internal sphincter is going to be essentially the wall of the anus. We can't differentiate it. The external sphincter is going to be this little dark signal that's just outside of it over here and over here. And as you go superiorly, at some point, it's going to be contiguous with the puborectalis muscle, which is going to be a muscle that comes across over here and over here. Some axial images for you. Again, we know what the internal sphincter is. We're all experts at that now. I'm talking about the external sphincter. It's outside of it, this dark band that's wrapping around the anus. And as you go kind of from more superior to inferior, sometimes it takes on a more V-shaped configuration as you just follow it down. So we got an internal sphincter, we have an external sphincter, and we have a space in between it, aptly named the intersphincteric space. All right, so that's going to be this stuff over here in yellow. And for practical purposes, you know, and all it contains is fat. Maybe a few vessels, maybe a few tiny nodes here and there, but really just contains fat. And that's an important space to know about. So this is what it looks like on the axial images. It's just going to be this yellow space in between the internal and external sphincters. Right over here, highlighted in blue. So again, if we look at a coronal image, we know what the internal sphincter is. We know what the external sphincter is. And this, at the tip of my arrow, this really kind of bright, bright appearing signal between the two is going to be fat within the intersyncteric space. All right? On axial images, again, internal sphincters, this whole thing over here. External sphincter is the dark signal outside of it. And in between is the intersyncteric fat, intersyncteric space, which contains fat. Again, has bright signal. And so if you know those three things, you're well ahead of the game. Now I'll make things a little bit more confusing. I know from my experience with the residents, they love these muscles when I question them about it. Uh, the levator musculature, the most impossible muscles in my mind to kind of trace and, and, and talk about. But you know, they're important to know about. And uh, as you go upwards, so you have the external sphincter. Somewhere it's going to join and become the puborectalis. And as you go even more cephalid and more upwards, that's going to be a portion of the levator plate up here and up here. So that really convex bulging outwards muscles that go across over here. And you can see it over here as well on this coronal diagram. And it's made up of a bunch of muscles which um, are almost contiguous with one another and may be difficult to differentiate. And I don't 
need you guys to differentiate those muscles. You may need to know those muscles for multiple choice exams, and so you'll memorize it uh, when you need to know it. But understand that there's something called a levator plate that consists of these muscles, and that is kind of is seen when you go more cephalid from the external sphincter to the puborectalis, and now you get into the levator musculature up here. Okay. Oh, you have a question. The, ex the external sphincter is a continuation of the puborectalis, and the puborectalis, along with the other two muscles, make up the levator plate. They're a group of muscles. So in some sense, it may all be one contiguation, but it's actually contiguous with the puborectalis. So we have the two sphincters down. We have the space in between down. And this is also kind of important to, to know if you want to just name things uh, you know, appropriately. So we talked about our puborectalis muscle coming from the pubic symphysis, and it's posterior impression over there, so let's draw a line over there. All right, that line goes all the way back into the fat, and that's the uh, gluteal region over there. Anything above it is going to be the ischiorectal fossa. All right, so if you have anything happening in this space, it's going to be the ischiorectal fossa. And anything below it, it's going to be the ischioanal fossa. All right, that makes sense. And I find it very difficult, I'll be honest, on axial images as I scroll through to tell you where the ischiorectal fossa is, where the ischioanal fossa is, so I cheat. I don't need to really... I don't need to call it cheating, but look at all the images that you get. Look at your sagittals. And just pinpoint, you know, are you above or below that puborectalis muscle so you can uh, name things appropriately. Ultimately, it probably doesn't really matter how you, what you name it in your reports, but for our purposes, you know, we want to be uh, as accurate as possible. So just to kind of appreciate these, these are, you know, I think radiology is really difficult to view in static images. And, you know, you don't have the benefit of scrolling through things right now, but I'll scroll for you. This is a coronal image. This is a sagittal image, and we'll go through the same things again. As you go from uh, front over here to back, this is the bladder. That's the prostate gland. This is a coronal image. Here we get to the uh, anus. That's going to be the internal sphincter, this stuff here, the external sphincter over here, the intersyncteric space in between. At some point, this is going to go cephalid and continue, continue as a puborectalis muscle. As it goes even more cephalid, all that's going to be the levator plate over there. All right, so just look at that. That's a normal case. And on the axial, similarly, nice rectum, intersyncteric space, external sphincter. As you go higher up, at some point, this external sphincter is going to go and continue as the puborectalis muscle. Uh, and it's very difficult to delineate the rest of the levator plate on axial images. That sound reasonable, guys? Pretty much experts on anatomy now. That's all you need to know. Just know your internal sphincters, know the space in between, and know that there's a, something called a levator plate that goes higher up. So let's talk about MR evaluation. MR is really the standard of care to evaluate these things. And I see Dr. Burrell sitting there, I'm sure. Occasionally, you may get cases where you have to inject these fistulas under fluoroscopy and see them. <laughs> but uh, I haven't had to do one, I don't think, in a long time in my training. Um, and nowadays, we, get, we get, a, get, a, uh, get asked to evaluate this on MR a lot. And, uh, you know, and, and it's really because MR has amazing soft tissue resolution. You can really see these things very well. And I'll tell you, at least for the residents, uh, this is becoming a very popular thing that our ER physicians order uh, when patients come into the ER. So these are immersion studies. So we've been, you know, woken up at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, to read these studies. So uh, this is important to, to be familiar and know how to interpret these. So who gets perianal fistula? A whole bunch of people can get them. But the idea here is that there is some degree of chronic or ongoing infection or inflammation for whatever reason. It could be traumatic, some infection as a result of that, radiation for other tumors, for example, um, or tumor itself can give you these fistulas. Sometimes they're not really sure why it happens. But in our patient population, the vast majority of people who get it are those with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, we had a case yesterday with ulcerative colitis. And why does it happen? Well, the ongoing theory is something called the cryptoglandular hypothesis, which is really cool to say. And that explains some of these reasons why the um, perianal fistulas happen. So we're back to our diagram. We're all familiar with this now. And we'll introduce that. Uh, it doesn't happen to happen, uh, have to happen at the dentate line, but because you have a lot of anal glands concentrated in that area, 
that for whatever reason you have infection, you have inflammation, these anal glands, which should normally, this is in blue, open up and, and drain into the, the bowel, they get blocked up, right? So that opening gets blocked up. So now you have this, you know, in, you know, this gland that can't drain properly and there's stasis and that can get infected. And one thing you'll find uh, in the human body is that whenever something's under a little bit of pressure, it finds a way to decompress. It doesn't like to be in that sort of pressure. And so uh, we can see another anal gland in the axial uh, plane over here, and it is how that gland decompresses into the adjacent areas of the anus that determines the types of fistulas you get, the types of aptices you get. And so what do we do for our technique? All right, we do a whole bunch of sequences. Um, our key sequences, in my opinion, are three. Right? We've talked about this T2-weighted imaging. That's what the I stands for there. Sequence, uh, in which fluid is bright. And uh, I find that very useful to look at anatomy. So we've shown a whole bunch. All the images we've shown so far are these T2-weighted non-fat sat images. I'll explain what that is in a second. So that's very good scroll up and down. And we do them in different planes, in the axial plane, in the coronal plane. Figure out your anatomy. Then we apply something called a uh, fat sad band. And what that basically does is makes all this fat over here go very dark. You see all that fat is very dark. And you know, we tweak the sequence a little bit. And this sequence is even better at the T2-weighted images to look for fluid. All right, so I use the T2 without fat saturation to look for anatomy. And I use this sequence to really look at the tracks. Is there fluid in it, high T2 signal? Is there an abscess? The abscess contains pus and fluid that also will have high T2 signal. So I use these together. And the last sequence that I like to use is what we call a T1-weighted sequence. On T1-weighted sequences, fluid is dark. All right, T2, it's bright. T1, it's dark. I use a T1-weighted sequence. We give a little bit of contrast. And we have this C1 post-contrast sequence. It's very good to delineate the borders of the fistula. Okay, and, and figure out if there's an abscess, if it's a rim-enhancing collection. So these three sequences, I think, are the most important sequences that I look at uh, when we do uh, these fistulas. And they basically do a combination of these types of sequences uh, when we evaluate these, uh, these studies. Back to our diagram again, a little bit of a close-up. You know, a lot, a lot of, some of you may have done MRI rotations. Some of you will do MRI rotations. And... You know, the idea of this getting an axial image or a coronal image, if we look at this in sagittal plane, if we were to get a true axial through this, a regular axial or a regular coronal would be in this plane, right? And a true axial, uh, how we would normally get it, would be in this plane. The problem with that is that you're not really, you could be kind of missing some of the uh, fistulous tracks itself. You really want to go axial and coronal with respect to the plane of the anus, which, in fact, is kind of in this plane over here. So we don't want, we want to make sure technologists don't do that. And they're very good at not doing that, but we have to monitor these studies. We want to make sure that they, they do it properly. So we don't like that. Instead, our coronals will be, as such, angled a little bit, so we get into the plane of the anus over there, and angle this way in order to get proper axials. All right, so that's how we do our T2-weighted sequences in order to get the best anatomy um, on these cases. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about our reporting checklist. All right, we all know the anatomy now. We know what sequences to look at. Excuse me. I'll touch upon this now, and then we'll go through the types of fistulas, and we'll touch upon this again so you guys can kind of get a, uh, your head around all these things. So when we talk about anal fistulas, one of the important things to make sure you mention is where the mucosal opening is, so where it's arising from within the anus. And when we look at the anus in our axial images, we pretend it's a little clock. Right? So 12 o'clock is there, and you go clockwise, you get 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock. And so you know, we mentioned that the anal mucosal opening appears to be arising from a certain clock position, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6.45, something like that. Uh, but um, that's for the opening. The other thing you want to tell your referring physician, the distance of that opening from the anal verge. Right, the anal verge is really where the anus meets the gluteal, the skin portion over there. So that's this arrow over here. And so if you can, give them an approximation 
Uh, is it you know, two centimeters above it? Is it three centimeters above it? Is it two and a half centimeters above it? It helps them when they go in and try to figure out where these fistulas are. Obviously, we want to talk about the type of fistulas. And uh, as you'll see, you know, at least at Yale, they're seldom just simple fistulas. They tend to be very complex. And they can be challenging. But the key is to try to make it simple for yourself and just take each you know, individual fistula and just describe it with the same sort of nomenclature and uh, kind of go through it systematically. Mention if there's an abscess, right? If there's an abscess, then you may need to do an intervention and drain it. Mention if the uh, fistulas and the abscesses or, you know, is there a lot of swelling and edema of adjacent muscles or organs even is how aggressive really is this infection. And you want to also want to make sure for a supralevator component. So this is the levator plate. And as you'll see, some of these fistulas can travel upwards and abut this area or go right through it. And the problem with now these fistulas going cephalid and going in this location is that uh, they're starting to enter the pelvis itself. And once you start to enter the pelvis, the chances of that infecting you know, organs and other structures in the pelvis is a little bit more likely, obviously. And uh, chances of those infections being more aggressive is more likely. So that's something that you know, the, they, the colorectal surgeons may want to uh, act upon a little bit faster. So we'll go through this at the end as well. All right, so let's start talking about our types of fistulas. Now, some of you may have come across this. Some of you may have done research in this. Some of you may re read about this for fun. And, and you'll see that there's some classification schemes for fistulas. I'm not going to tell you about them yet, but I'm going to describe what these fistulas are, and, and if you're able to describe them, you're automatically placing it into a, one of those classification schemes. So I don't like to remember all these schemes. I just want to be able to describe what I see, and then that way you'll see that it'll fit into one of those classification schemes. The first type of fistula is called a superficial fistula. So here we have an anal gland again that's infected, that's blocked, and now it needs to escape. So this one decides that it's going to go right through the anal wall itself without really disturbing that internal sphincter. Okay? Now some, the literature would suggest that it's, you know, it goes from any from 10 to 20 percent, 16 percent I've read in one study. And uh, my feel, I haven't really seen a good case of this. I had one case recently, but not many cases at Yale. So I think it's a, probably a little less common than, than, than that number, but that's the number out in the literature. It's certainly not the most common type of fistula. So this is the case we saw recently. So that's what it looks like. This is a T2 weighted image in the coronal plane, and this is a T1 weighted image with fat saturation and with contrast. Right? We said on T2 weighted images, fluid appears bright. So here we have this uh, collection here and a little tract going downwards. And on T1 weighted images, fluid is dark, but as an abscess, its rim will be enhancing. So we have a rim enhancing collection with a tract that goes downwards here. And as it turns out, this didn't really go through the anal wall itself. It was kind of confined to the anus and didn't kind of breach through the, um, through the anal wall into the uh, intersyncteric space. And so if you look at it on axial imaging as we scroll through it, there's a lot of other fistulas, but you can see this is the abscess at the top. And going downwards continues as a tract completely within the anus itself. So this would be a type of superficial fistula. And you can now here see the intersyncteric space that looks clean. On our T1 weighted post contrast image, we can see a rim enhancing collection. Again, fluid is dark on T1 weighted images, so we don't expect here to see any signal here. We do see that it's rim enhancing, and it goes all the way down, all the way down over here. And again, does not go through into the intersyncteric space. So superficial fistula is very uncommon. If you want to forget about it, you're allowed to forget about it. And I don't want you to forget about this one. All right, so one of our objectives was to go through the two most common types of fistulas, and this is probably the most common type of fistula that you'll see, this intersyncteric fistula. So by the same logic that we've gone through so far, you have a gland that's obstructed, needs to escape. So what's this one going to do? It's going to go right through, go through the anus, go through the internal sphincter, and it's going to go through the intersyncteric space and kind of decompress through that route. It will not cross the external sphincter over here. All right, it'll go escape and, and track down uh, to the gluteal region. So this is an example of what it would look like. 
on static images. I have dynamic images after this. Coronal T2 weighted image, T1 post contrast image in the same plane. You can see there's this very you know, thin fistula right over here. Okay? If you compare it to the other side, you don't quite see anything that looks like this on the other side. And when you give contrast, the uh, rim of that collection enhances, and the internal portion of it, like right over here, shows no enhancement. So this is a very small, fluid-filled, intersyncteric fistula. Now, if I were to describe it, you know, I could figure out where the clock opening is on the axial images, I think on the next slide, and I can discuss where the distance from the anal verge is probably from here to here. So that would be one way how to describe this fistula. It's right over there. So again, we can look at it now on the uh, axial images, post-contrast sequence. This is an interesting teric fistula. It's arising, in my opinion, from about the 10 o'clock position. This is the external sphincter. That's the internal sphincter. This is the interesting teric fat. And as you scroll downwards, it is confined to the interesting teric space. And so it's an interesting teric fistula. So if I were to describe this, I would say there is a interesting teric fistula containing a little bit of fluid. The tract contains a little bit of fluid. It arises from the 10 o'clock position at approximately this many centimeters from the anal verge. And that's a very succinct way uh, to describe this, uh, this fistula. And then I would say, you know what, I don't see an abscess associated with it as well. And just to kind of hammer this point home, this is a T2-weighted images with fat sat. We can see, once again, a, uh, a fistula with fluid in it. This is the same fistula that's tracking uh, all the way downwards to the gluteal cleft over here. Now, if life were like that with fistulas, I'd be very happy. I'd be happy to read these studies. But the problem is that invariably, these fistulas come, and uh, they can be simple like this. But a lot of times, and particularly for the emergency room, they tend to be really complex. All right? they, you know, they come down here. Then they decide to have a secondary tract going upwards or associated with an abscess. They can have this horseshoe-shaped uh, kind of abscess uh, as well. And so you want to make sure that you look for all these things. And, I'm not going to go through, well, this case actually shows you what, uh, you know, an interesting teric fistula with an abscess would look like. Again, we have a fistula that arises, looks like from the 3 o'clock position. Here to here, I can measure the distance from the anal verge. So it's an interesting teric fistula from the 3 o'clock position, goes downwards, and terminates in this rim-enhancing collection on these T1-weighted images. So that's a big abscess over there. So uh, the colorectal surgeons will need to take care of that. And this is just a static image showing the tract that this goes downwards and terminates in this abscess. In this case we had from the ER a few months ago, just shows you how complex these cases can be. You know, here we have this kind of a, a horseshoe-shaped collection. It's actually pretty much circumferential around the anus, and there's tracks that are going downwards in the interstenteric space, terminating in the abscess down here. There's another abscess up here. There's tracks going upwards there. So, um, you know, this guy's in a lot of trouble. But, you know, again, you just kind of go through each mucosal opening, tell you, you know, tell them where it's opening from, distance from the anal verge, is it associated with an abscess or not? Do it systematically and, and you'll get through the case. So I want you to know about interesting teric fistulas. Then I want you to know about transfing teric fistulas because you're going to see these ones as well. And these ones, as you can imagine, we have an anal gland that's blocked. It doesn't decompress through the anus. It doesn't decompress through the interesting teric space. But this one goes through the external sphincter as well and decompresses uh, downwards to that ischio anal fat pad and just like that. I'll show you another example of that. This is a T2 uh, weighted image with fat saturation. And we can see a tract that's coming from the uh, 6 o'clock position. This is the internal sphincter. That's the external sphincter. It goes through both and goes downwards terminating uh, in the region at the left uh, glute uh, gluteal region. And with contrast you can see that this tract rim enhances uh, sometimes the rim enhancement may be difficult to appreciate because it's really, really small, but you've got to window it, you've got to zoom up. But this is a fluid-filled transphenteric fistula arising from the 6 o'clock position. And this is the static image showing how it's arising from like the 6 o'clock position and going through both the internal and external sphincters out to the issue anal fat pad. And they can be kind of subtle uh, at times as well. So here we have uh, another case of a... Uh, uh, a gentleman with a perianal fistula, and this tract is really, really small. It may contain like a, a tiny amount of fluid, and you can see it coming from here. 
So I'd maybe say that's a three o'clock position. Certainly crosses the internal sphincter, crosses the external sphincter as well, which would be over here. And this is the track, so it's gone right through it and goes all the way down where it's to the uh, left gluteal cleft. And you can see that tract a little bit better, I think, with the post-contrast imaging right over there, if you follow it, coming out from the 3 o'clock position and extending downwards right over there. And this is what it looks like on the static image. Just like, kind of looks like the diagram that I drew going all the way downward over here. And again, if all I had was simple appearing intersyncteric fistulas and simple appearing transfinteric fistulas, my life would be really amazing. Uh, but this always makes it more interesting that all these transfinteric fistulas can have multiple of additional tracts and multiple abscesses, and so you want to be able to look for them and comment on them. So here we have a case, really complex fistula. So it comes across, again, from the 6 o'clock position, crosses the internal sphincter. This is the external sphincter coming across. So it crosses both. So we've deemed it to be an uh, a transphincteric fistula. But as it goes downwards, it goes into this area. And that area goes into, into this area, and this area, and this area, and this one, and this one. So multiple secondary tracts and abscesses in that location. One of these tracts goes anteriorly. Um, so a real uh, mess over there. Um, and you know, you, for this one, I would just say that there's a, you know, a, a transphincteric fistula arises from the six o'clock position, however many centimeters from the anal verge. It courses downwards into the uh, right gluteal region where it's associated with multiple secondary tracts and a couple of abscesses measuring this by this by this and this by this by this. So again, in one line, you can kind of describe what you're seeing. So those are the two things that you'll see the most common Intersphincteric and transphincteric, and we know how to diagnose them. I'll talk about this supersphincteric fistula. And in this, you have uh, a mucosal gland that's blocked, and instead of decompressing caudally or through the uh, external sphincter at the same level, this one's actually going to travel upwards for whatever reason and, and exit through the levator plate, or at least abut the levator plate. And that's why you need to know about the levator musculature. And so again, we don't see too many of these that common. This was uh, uh, one that we saw where you have a fistula from like I think a six o'clock, seven o'clock position. One tract goes downwards. It's an intersynteric tract. Let's follow the other tract going upwards and up and up and up and up like this. And this is the levator plate that's coming in over here and going all the way and abutting it. And I don't think this one went right through it. So I don't know if I can technically call it, you know, supersphincteric fistula, but certainly you would say that this is a uh, an interesting teric fistula with a tract that goes upwards and abuts the levator plate. And that's fairly important, as I said, because once it's to that level, the chances of it infection, infecting the remaining organs and, and structures in the pelvis is it's a lot more likely. So they need to intervene on that uh, sooner than later. This is a static image showing this rim-enhancing tract going all the way upwards to the levator musculature. And on this image, it shows that there's a little bit of fluid in it um, going all the way upwards. And finally, one of the least common is this extrasphincteric fistula. So as its name implies, it, this does not arise in the anus, right? Because the anus is a sphincter. This is extrasphincteric, so it's outside of the anus. And uh, very uncommon. And the idea here is that this arises for whatever reason, perhaps from the rectum, and exits through the levator plate, something like that. And and we don't, I don't have actually an example of this. Uh, you know, we checked through our database of cases. I couldn't really find one, at least one that was described over here so far. And the only issue with this one is that the, the idea of this cryptoglandular hypothesis, we have an anal gland that gets obstructed and decompresses through the you know, anatomy of the anus, doesn't really apply to this. Um, there may be other glands that get obstructed and, 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 and result in these ectrosynteric fistula, but um, certainly the cryptoglandular hypothesis does not apply to these fistulas, but it's important to know about them in case you come across it and to indicate that this in fact does not arise from the anus itself, but higher up in the rectum and large bowel. Now one of the things that you'll come across in our reports when you look at these uh, cases is this concept of granulation tissue or phlegminous collection. So, for me, an abscess is a, you know, a rim-enhancing, kind of loculated collection. It's a discrete collection that contains fluid inside of it, such that if I put a needle, I can suck out some fluid, suck out some pus from it. 
A phlegmon is something that may rim enhance, but inside of it, I don't see fluid. I see kind of more granulation and maybe a very tenacious kind of material that's very difficult to kind of suck out if I put a needle in it. And so, you know, it's very difficult. It's important to mention that to the surgeons because they need to know if they're going to go in there, they're probably going to have a really tough time getting anything out of it. And some of these tracks, as we've seen, a lot of them will contain fluid, so they'll have bright T2 signal, and they'll be rim enhancing. But some of them won't contain fluid. They'll be the remnants of um, prior tracks that have since closed up. And those ones will not have any bright T2 signal. So if you look at this, you know, I don't see any fluid signal here. I, just, I do see bright signal, but it's certainly not as bright as I would expect you know, fluid in, say, the bladder to be. All right, so there's no discrete fluid in this. And there's no track that I can see that's rim enhancing. So if I see something like this, I'd say, you know, there's a, there's a perianal fistula at this mucosal opening, at this distance from the anal verge, but it doesn't contain fluid. It contains more granulation material. And that's important for them to know about because they can't really do much if it doesn't contain fluid. And one of the last things I'll mention in terms of looking at these is that sometimes one of the treatments for these... Uh, perianal fistulas is they place the seton, which is like a little suture through that fistula tract. And the idea, as I understand, is that you put the suture in and it causes some pressure necrosis inside the tract and the body then kind of regenerates tissue in that area to kind of fill up the tract that's, that had fluid in it. Um, and so you'll see that sometimes uh, when we follow these patients and it'll look like this curvilinear, very, very dark or hypo-intense structure that uh, you know, is within the mucosal opening of the anus and goes throughout that tract in the fistula. So don't be alarmed when you see one of those things or just a seton. So we're experts at fistulas. We know the anatomy. We know how to describe them. We have a checklist. And these were the two classification schemes that I think you'll come across if you do a little bit more reading about this. There's the Parks classification scheme, which is a surgical classification scheme. And in some sense, it's very similar to what I went through in terms of the intersyncteric and transyncteric fistulas. And then the St. James classification scheme, which is actually a, a radiology classification scheme. And in that one, it's similar, except they break down the fistulas into whether they're simple, with just one tract, or intersyncteric fistulas with abscesses or secondary tracts, and a transyncteric fistula, or a transyncteric fistula with abscess or secondary tract. And the fifth one's a supralevator one, and extrasyncteric also kind of goes in there. So you can sit and you can memorize this, or you can learn how to just describe these. Because if you describe them properly, you're automatically putting them into one of these classification schemes. And at least our surgeons don't require us to put it in the report, so I don't commit this to memory. This is just to show you that if you, wherever you go and whatever you end up doing, you may come across this scheme, and so now at least you've, you've heard of it. So we'll go back to a reporting checklist now that we know the anatomy, now that we know what these fistulas look like. We know the classification schemes. Remember, we talk about where it's opening from. Use the clock. Remember the distance from the anal verge. You can use sagittal or coronal images to determine that. Talk about the type of fistula. Talk about if there are multiple components, if there are abscesses associated with it. Is there edema and swelling of the muscles, bones? A lot of these fistulas can go and infect the bones, and there could be osteomyelitis. So you need to be able to, to mention that um, to your colorectal surgeons. Check if there's any components that go above the levator plate, abut the levator plate, or go through it, uh, as that can have uh, clinical consequences. And again, we've uh, been acquainted with this uh, classification scheme. We've gone through anatomy and MR evaluation. Let's go back to our objectives. Everyone knows now what the internal and external sphincters look like. Everyone knows the two most common types of perianal fistulas intersyncteric and transyncteric. And we're all familiar with a reporting checklist in order for us to tackle these cases. And that's perianal fistulas. Thank you.